This episode is brought to you by ADT. Mysteries are always fun to unravel, but not when it comes to your home security. Luckily, there's ADT. They now professionally install Google Nest products with their smart home security, which means plenty of smart devices to help you protect what matters most. Because ADT believes the smarter the home, the safer the security. To see how ADT can help make your home smarter and safer, visit ADT.com. Whoops, this is Michelle. It looks like the second half of our Dahmer episode got lost in the upload, but that's okay because it's here now. So welcome to part two of the Jeffrey Dahmer episode. Hi, I'm Michelle Ward. As a mom, I've looked my children in the eyes with love and hoped I can lead them toward a bright, wonderful future. But as a neurocriminologist who's been studying violent crime for the last 20 years, I've also quietly hoped that, at the very least, I'm not raising a future serial killer. And if you can relate to that taboo thought, congratulations, you've just found your new favorite podcast. This is How Not to Raise a Serial Killer. And to to know at 10 years old that that's going to, obviously he was doing it to mask his his feelings, you know, his, Mm -hmm. his voices or his, you know, thoughts in his head, maybe, um, that's pretty intense for a 10 year old to go and maybe still scotch, scotch, scotch out of his parents' cabinet or whatnot. Yeah. Maybe scotch was the only drink they had, but he says he started drinking heavily and we'll get deeper into that too, because he just needed to quell the urges. And I should mention there were other environmental problems in it. His parents fought horribly before they divorced when he was 17 or 18. Nasty divorce, nasty fights. And being around a tense, violent household is far worse than divorcing and being in a peaceful household. Even though divorce is not great, the effects of living among that much tension isn't good on a developing brain, a child. We know this. Even even a teenager. Even Well, yeah, maybe even especially a teenager. Yeah, you're living in an environment that you can't control and you're, you're kind of, it's just, you know, there's no peace. So you're constantly having this static noise going around you. And, mm-hmm. and you know, so then you, you might, maybe he was drinking because of that as well to escape. Exactly. I mean, he says it in his own words, and we'll get to it later, exactly what he was doing and why. Yeah, and alcohol Um, does have effect, especially hard alcohol on your brain, doesn't it, right? Especially when your brain's that young. It does different things. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so these aren't inconsequential, as I've mentioned. And his mom also took some medication when she was pregnant. She suffered from um, perinatal and um, postpartum depression, and... I I believe they were all prescribed by a doctor and they were not totally uncommon back then. But, you know, in our deep dives to try to, you know, for the whys, the why, the truth, that is something that came up. I don't, I have any information or any reason to believe that that caused this, but I should just mention it because it's out there. Yeah, my mom did too. So that would explain a lot. Yeah. And and didn't with me. Yeah. (laughs) Dun, 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 dun. Did other things with me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, parenting. Parenting. And listen, now that I'm a parent, I'm like, sorry, mom, I was a little hard on you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you think of your parents as nothing but parents. You forget that they are just people who had kids. And trying so. their best to make mistakes. And Exactly. Well, right now, I was, I'm going to address um, listeners' questions at the end, but some of them I'm going to sprinkle in here because they're just apropos of what we're talking about. One listener question that I think is important to cover now is what do I think Dahmer would have turned out this way if his dad had not shown him how to preserve animals? So contrary to what we saw in the Netflix show, which is his dad really kind of um, supporting his interest in roadkill, helping him preserve it, fetching roadkill with him and for him, in reality, Lionel never taught his son about dissecting, discarding, and preserving animal parts. He only found out about that once his son was arrested. That is, you know, something that Netflix added for cinematic purposes. You you have to keep the story interesting. It's not, it's not a true documentary. This is a, it's a movie, it's a show, it's a series. So they are going to take, yeah, it's entertainment. They're going to take some liberties. So that was a great question. 
Um, you know, again, Netflix is doing what we all do. We all try to go back in the past and, and f- figure it out. Why is this guy like this? I think the focus, you know, I'm going to keep saying it. I think we're missing the big elephant in the room, which is this disorder he had. Um, and if we look at all of this through that lens, we see his obsession with the animals. That's one of his weird, eccentric fascinations um not uncommon in schizotypy i think i think it's where it starts you start somewhere you, you know somewhere you're going to start uh, abusing animals and then because you know you don't just uh, i don't think typically you don't go and start abusing humans and people like you have to start somewhere well you're bringing up a great point that's what we normally see in serial killers they start with animals and they ramp up this is not that this is different. And I remember just, I remember one of the graduate students just saying, you can't think of him as the same as all of our other serial killers. He, the fascination was not in hurting the animal. He never killed or hurt a single animal. Never. He was fascinated with their anatomy, with their bodies, with their intestines, their organs. It was that. So Yeah. So he, it's a huge departure. On paper, it looks like all of our killers. But when you dig deeper, you're like, no, 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 no. He didn't want to hurt animals and build his way up to humans. He didn't like hurting anybody. His fascination was anatomy. And now we're getting into that because he reported right when he was arrested that he realized he was gay around 13 or 14. And I should mention until the day he died, I think he had more of a problem accepting his homosexuality than he did his homicides. Like, he was more, like, unaccepting of that than the fact that he was a gruesome serial killer. And at that time, we weren't very acceptable of that type of behavior in the 70s, you know? Like, he would have been feeling those urges right. at 13. So the seven, Although that was, like, the peak time when things started happening, um, you still can't go home and tell your parents or your kids or your teachers, you know? Even his dad said, had you known that Jeffrey was um, gay, what would you have done? He said, I would try to get him some help to work through that. So you're right. It wasn't an accepted thing back then, as accepted as it is now. I mean, to me, that's when I hear somebody wanting to change somebody who's gay, it makes my skin crawl. But well, it's at this point, around 13 or 14, when he realizes that, that he reports he started also fantasizing about having sex with a dead body. And it's also when he started masturbating, heavy masturbating, he calls it. I know my sister can't hand, cannot discuss sex with Heidi. No, you can. But at 13? Heidi, boys masturbate at 13. Well, I understand. But just the whole dead body thing. And then the the heavily masturbate, heavily, like three to four times a day. And, you know, in my, I have a tiny background in social work and whatnot. And a lot of the, victims of sexual abuse they at an early age 13 yes i know they're starting to get in hormones and whatnot but the heavily part is actually a pattern of a someone a, a young child who has been sexually abused yeah it's definitely something that you can see with somebody who's been sexually abused you can see you know you can see masturbation of course but even more deviant you know you've told me stories even of that 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 go beyond normal exploration of your body but fantasizing about having sex with a dead body is where we take a departure from normal um, fantasies and that i think is you know it lines up with his fascination with with roadkill he's having unusual urges bizarre behavior he's eccentric It, it, it It comports with the schizotypal personality disorder. I don't think people with schizotypal personality disorder necessarily have urges to, you know, he didn't have urges to kill. He had urges to have sex with a dead body. And it's an important distinction because most killers kill to kill. So they, a serial killer, this does not make, we know that, and and we're going to dive into it. And he reports that he never had sex with any of the animals. He was collecting them, but their internal organs aroused him sexually. And we're going to get into that more later. But Jeffrey Dahmer does not discuss any of these urges with anyone. So he's not one of those who I could point to and be like, well, someone should have stopped him here. He slipped through the cracks there. This is a failure of the system. Uh Uh-uh. 
he's well hidden. Yeah, when you want to keep a secret, you can keep it. You don't, and you don't have a lot of friends, and you isolate yourself, and you're quiet, and all of these things are going on in his head, and he's acting out on them probably privately, where nobody can see. So nobody mm-hmm. knows. Nobody knows. You know. And I found it very interesting that he never killed any animals. He went straight to killing humans. So he experimented with dead animals constantly. He says he almost killed an Irish setter that he brought home once. He had planned to skin it and then dissect it, but he couldn't once the little doggy looked him in the eye. And those are his words. So there was some level of connectedness that may have, that stopped him. He connected to that animal that stopped him from killing the dog. And maybe connectedness would have stopped him from killing people too. But I don't think he had any connectedness. Around 16 years old, he had a fantasy, a specific one, about hitting someone over the head, rendering them unconscious, and then having sex with them. And he became absolutely obsessed with the thought of having someone in his possession over whom he had total control. I don't think he's talking about dom- dominating. I think he's like, because that person still will have their own thoughts and opinions and might n- want to leave. I mean physical control over a body without a thinking brain. He was emphatically clear that he did not want to hurt anybody, and he absolutely never tor- tortured anybody on purpose. I mean, yes, what he did to them is torturous by anybody's standards, but he didn't enjoy the torture. It was serial killers do do that sometimes. Like if you have a killer who's just killing for financial gain, you know, robbing. Th- we have serial killers who literally are just serial rapists who kill the witness. So, yes, they're serial killers, but their goal is not to kill. Their goal is just to rape. And then they have to get rid of the body, the witness. This is, a again, we have not seen somebody like Dahmer before. He wanted a unconscious body to keep with him forever. And he was simply unable to control the tsunami of deviant sexual urges. It's not that it came up, you know, sexual arousal pops up here and again. This he describes it, is is like drinking water, finding food, shelter. It was up there in urges. Like the the very basic primordial urges that we have, he, his included this. He says his fantasy was to completely dominate the Chippendale male stripper type, to be clear. It wasn't just anybody he wanted. Yeah, he had a type, and he wanted to keep them for disposal for his grat- sexual gratification. How old was he when... When he did, when he first killed somebody, or when he eighteen, him. he's his first kill when it was when he was eighteen, and we're going to get into that one right now. But the the targets had to be young, fit, good looking males, and he knew this was wrong. So to kind of quell it, he 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 looked for ideas. So he would increase his pornography, increase his masturbation, and increase his drinking, all in an attempt to squash the compulsions. But eventually, it was not enough, and he committed his first murder. On June 18th, 1978. June 18th. <laughs> That's Pablo's birthday. That's somebody in our family's <laughs> birthday. Yeah. He, it was a hitchhiker he found, and he convinced this guy to go back to his house for a couple of beers. And then Dahmer reports that he choked the, the man with a barbell. He smashed his body to bits with a sledgehammer and then scattered pieces into his yard. And a search did turn up more than 500 pieces of bone. That feels like a lot of work. And then when he was asked why, Dahmer told investigators, well, the guy wanted to leave, and I didn't want him to leave. So that's as a 31-year-old, he told the police. That was 13 years later. So after he kills the hitchhiker, whose name was Stephen Mark Hicks, he was bringing the, the parts of the body he couldn't scatter in his yard, he had put into um, garbage bags. And he's bringing it to the dump when he gets pulled over by the police. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. They pull him over, they they have flashlights, they look in the back, and they say, well, what, what smells so bad, and what's in those bags? And he said, oh, I'm just bringing old garbage to the dump. They didn't check it, they let him go, they gave him a ticket, and they let him go. But that was enough to scare Dahmer to believe that he was close to getting caught. So he waits to kill again for another 10 years. And we're going to learn what he did to, to satiate those overwhelming urges, which are just ramping up, right? Like, he didn't plan... That first killing, it happened, and and then he's able to not kill for 10 years. 
But when he did kill again, it was a man named Stephen Tuomi, and he killed him at the Ambassador Hotel in 1986 or 1987. Um, Dahmer hadn't killed since the hitchhiker, and he didn't intend to kill Tuomi. But he says when he woke up in the morning on top of dead Tuomi, he realized that he had beaten the man to death with his bare hands. He has no memory of this. To the day he died. Do you think he really did take 10 more years before killing someone, or do you think he's done, he did something? Because that's a long time to fight off urges like that. It really is, but I think the urges didn't ramp up to the degree... They were when he was on his mass, like, massacre until this this second killing. Um, so then he purchases a suitcase to transport Tuomi's body. He hails a cab. The cabbie helps him lift the suitcase into the trunk. Yeah, gross. And the cabbie's like, why does this smell so bad? What's in it? And Dahmer ignores him. And then the cab drops Dahmer and the body off at Dahmer's grandma's house, who he had lived with on and off. Grandma's important. Um, Dahmer really cared about his family. Like, he loved his dad. He loved, he adored his grandma. He's not devoid of, he's not like a typical, he's not a psychopath. He's just not a psychopath. And he he reads very much more like a person with schizotypal personality disorder who connects to their family, um, but just not to anybody else. He never hurt anybody in his family. He's never going to. And, you know, he didn't like hurting people anyway, but... He was actually quite respectful of his grandma, and he did dismember and kill people in her house, but he didn't, like, he knew that that was wrong. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry, Grammy. So, and he did that to Duomo there. Um, But Dahmer maintained until his death that he had no recollection of that murder. And this murder had consequences beyond the death of, you know, this poor man, it unleashed this murderous dragon that Dahmer had kept caged for a decade. But once this killing happened and this dragon was released, there was no stopping this path of destruction. And that's that's from Dahmer himself. And as you know, he killed a lot of boys and men. It's kind of sad. Like, you wonder, like, I, I mean, I of course, I don't have those feelings. I'm not in his, his head space, but... Isn't there a point where you kind of say, mom, dad, if, especially if you care for your family and trust them, like, I'm struggling. I'm having these mm-hmm. horrible, awful thoughts and impulses. And, you know, like, I, I just, mm-hmm. I don't know, like, because I, I, obviously I'm not in his place, but isn't there a point where you, you would think you would say something to someone and reach out for help? Yeah. And some, and some murderers do. Um, again, I don't. I don't think he had the wherewithal, the connectedness to do that. I don't think he had enough guilt. He had enough guilt to to look for ways to not kill people. He didn't want to he didn't like killing people. But he so he's he's got more empathy than a psychopath, but less than you and me. Um he did say at one point he he says a couple things. He says, yeah, it's good that I've been caught because I definitely would keep doing this and please don't let me out of jail. But he also didn't have enough empathy or guilt to turn himself in. And yeah, because it sounds like he has common sense, like, don't let me out. I can't do this. I can't stop. Mm-hmm. But then he didn't have enough to... I, and like normal serial killers, they kill because they have like a purpose. Like... um you know, they want, yeah. He just was killing to fight impulses and fight his feelings and his compulsion and his fascination, which is kind of different. I think, like, it's different. And we'll we'll dive into that. That whole what the different types of serial killers and how he fits into none of them. He's very not stereotypical. That's for sure. Right. I'm not going to go into all 17 murders because it would be overkill. <laughs> no pun intended. And those horrifying details are found everywhere right now. But it's important to note that he did pick up these men and boys at gay bars, bathhouses, porn shops. And when he would bring them home, usually offered them money for just to take pictures of them or even sometimes money for sex. And sometimes, you know, it was just to come over. But he would always add sleeping pills to their drinks to sedate them. And then he would rape them. He would take advantage of them. Dahmer put a tremendous amount of thought into how to create 
his fantasy, which is a submissive sex slave, either semi-alive or in a preserved state in death. And it was a monumental effort. He tried to freeze them, but that wouldn't last for long. He preserved parts of their bodies just to keep the part with them, not for trophies, but to feel, you know, his connectedness was not with alive humans. It was with body parts. And then he learned how to drill holes in the skull of an alive person and pour muriatic acid on their frontal lobes to render them semi-conscious. That's like a lobotomy. <laughs> yeah. Like, now it's not about bo- like internal body parts. It, it that I, I, well, it is. I can't even imagine. I I can't. I can't even think to what he was thinking. That's and that's the thing. It's hard to think like a person with. There, there is nobody who can do things like this, be a killer, and have a normal personality, a who have emotions and feelings like us. We know that. We know they're abnormal. His is just all the way. So this worked for a while. Like he could keep them in a semi-conscious state and then just be phys- physical with them for a while, but then eventually the victims would die. Um, he took a good care to try to make it painless. I don't know how painless a drill to the skull could be, but his, you know, he, he he did make an effort that way, which is unusual for a killer. Eventually he took to eating some of their body parts. And at first that was simple curiosity, as simple as that kind of curiosity could be. But then it was an effort to keep them part of him. Um, But I don't know if he doesn't understand how digestion works. Like you don't really. I thought about that as well, but. I just, I'm in shock right now. Like, I knew about the Dahmer case. I, you know, of course, we all read it. We all, I had didn't have not watched the Netflix series because I just, it's really intense. Even my daughter who loves horror movies and all that kind of stuff, she's like, it's very intense for me. So, like, for mm-hmm. me to think that he <clears throat> even had any, like, oh, well, I, you know, I didn't want to kill this person. I didn't want to do these things. Like when you were at first, when you were talking, I'm like, okay, now I just think it's bullshit. Like, I think he's just selfish and he may have had a mental illness, but my goodness, like drilling holes and just, he really Mm -hmm. took it to the next level. Like it was torture. He tortured them. Right. And he wasn't fucking around. He went really, you know, in, in, but the distinction I make is not, he's a better person. It's just, he's different than normally they love watching their victim squirm in pain. He hated it. And I believe him. (laughs) It's still, he's still a dick and he still did not have enough humanness to, I mean, if you really give a shit, you stop. And if you can't stop yourself, you turn yourself in. So I'm not saying, oh, let's hug him and be warm. But I was trying to be, I was trying to be sensitive to like, but I'm just like, wow, no. like there's a point where you, <laughs> as we raise kids and not serial killers, there is accountability. There is, Absolutely. you know, there's a point where you're like, come on, like. No, and he and he was aware enough to know that he he could have stopped. It. You can he be nice to your family and your grandmother and you can appreciate them as your family members, but you can just totally F up young boys. Mm-hmm. And oh, sorry. He's a monster beyond monsters. And and for for me, this is just to understand this monster and and how we can like maybe just like discern him from the others in the future because um, he doesn't look like the other ones, right? And I think you're trying to say too, it's not necessarily just your upbringing that raises a monster, or um, it's something that you could be born with, or something can happen mm-hmm. to you, um, and it's hard to to foresee what that person's going to do. Um, mm-hmm. It's just, it's, he, it's really intense. Like I couldn't. It's intense. Imagine. This one's intense. And then neighbors heard too from, I don't know if we want to get into all that. But oh yeah, like, we get into Yeah, that there was people that heard and they, it's just, there was no stopping him. And so then I think it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm-hmm. And, oh, I just want to, yeah. You want to punch him in the face? Well, someone did that for you in prison. So he described it like you just described it, getting bigger and bigger. And it would, he would, he would have a bit of satisfaction for a period of time. And 
then he would feel the need to do it again. And he tried to quell that. He tried to delay the need to do it again. He would rather have just killed one and kept it forever. But, um, and he would, he's like, okay, I always kept the skulls, always. Sometimes he kept the, the genitals were important to him, hands, other internal organs, but he kept the skulls always. That was like, and, and a lot of killers do keep a trophy, but these were not trophies. These were, he's, he wants connectedness to the body. It's very weird. He created a shrine um, to feed his obsession, not to honor the dead, but he added skulls and candles to to give him satisfaction, to to feel like they were still with him. So you, it was self-serving, whatever it was. He does sometimes sound like he has dashes of guilt, like when he, he and I, I think he's being honest, he never says things like, oh gosh, no, I hated that they had to die. He's not like that. He's not like a psychopath who tries to charm you and tells you about his bad upbringing and how you should feel sorry for him. Uh-uh. This guy takes full responsibility for it and he's just kind of matter of fact, like, look, they, I, I, I killed him. I wasn't going to not kill them. I just didn't enjoy that at all. I needed my zombie. So he says he kept the skulls and made this shrine because he wanted them to be just part of him. And and it got so bad that Heidi, he started carrying a mummified head with him to work to keep with him all the time. So it'd be in his locker. He just didn't want to, he didn't want to leave home, leave all his, all of his babies. He was sick. What was his profession? What did he do? For oh, you know, he worked at a chocolate factory. Oh my God. I wonder if he put stuff in the chocolate. You know, you wouldn't be the first person to have said that on a podcast. I wasn't even going to go there with the Willy Wonka chocolate bars. Um, but, I mean, he wasn't the most hygienic human. Yeah. That's not. That's not. Moving on. Okay. So the urge, the need, the compulsion became his sole awareness. And he says he thought it was only his only purpose in life. So... This is so bad. I want you to think of it almost like, you know, I used to talk about stalkers a lot and how their victim is all they think about all day, all night. And I think Dahmer was like this with his obsession. He wakes up in the morning. It's the first thing he thinks of. He's showering. He's brushing his teeth. It's all he's thinking of. He's eating food. He's walking down the street. He's mixing the chocolate. It's all on his mind. The overwhelming, it's all, these overpowering urges are all there is. It's like a fam, an animal, a famished predator that spends its entire life only hunting and sleeping. Like think of the Serengeti. And I've known many serial killers who have murdered solely for sexual pre- pleasure and their sexual gratification comes from the kill. So often they can't reach orgasm unless they are in the presence of a dying person. Sick as hell, obvi. But this was different. Dahmer doesn't kill for the kill. He kills to keep the victim so that he can satisfy this horrifying drive. And his urges, I've mentioned before, are not like normal sexual urges. They don't pop up once and again, you know, maybe once a day or throughout the week. It's more, I want you to think of it as like my urge to eat or to sleep, like the overwhelming to drink exactly. So he desperately tried to find alternatives. And I don't know how much of that was guilt as much as it was, it's hard to find people to kill. You know, I don't want to give him too much freaking credit. I don't think he was like, dang it, these poor families are missing them. I'm going to try not to kill. I think it was the hunt is hard. So then he started perusing obituaries of young men. And he even went to see like a, a young man in a casket and he thought he was hot. So then he went and tried to dig up his grave. But get this, the ground was too frozen because it was winter, and then the graveyard dog attacked him. Which, for me, that visual is like, it's amazing. Like, the graveyard dog is there to protect against grave robbers, of course, but, like, this monster is being attacked by a graveyard dog. It's poetic. Right. So... He would revisit the corpses he already had, but eventually the, even they failed to satisfy. And once he stole a mannequin as a proxy for a real person, but that didn't didn't cut it. That's what I was thinking, like the blow up doll type thing. Like, uh-huh. yeah, but it's not about that. It's about the insides and the. As you mentioned, serial killers they they usually, I mean, they're all very different, but they usually fall into like one of a, only a few categories. Either they kill because they get a rush from it. And those are usually, you know, your psychopathic killers. Psychopaths are born a little bit under aroused. So they, they become thrill seekers often and they're very goal driven. So 
whatever they want, they don't care who they hurt and in their goal, whether it's, you know, they're working in the financial market. They don't care whose money they lose. But if their goal, if they're getting their thrill from murder, they don't really care that they've killed you. And then, you know, there's other people who have who killed multiple people because of sexual gratification. Um, other people I mentioned who kill because they are raping and they need to eliminate the witness. Um, some serial killers are having psychotic episodes. And, you know, some people kill for financial gain. It's not that they are enjoying the kill. It's just they're enjoying the money they get from robbing you and you're in the way. Or they're panicked. Or I mean, there's a lot of reasons, I'm sure, yeah. why <clears throat> people kill 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 people. But, yeah, it's... Yeah. It's, I don't feel like you said earlier that this is really a common case at all. I've, I've not seen its equal. I've not seen its equal. Dahmer stands out from that crowd. And, you know, sure, you can find serial killers who have dismembered their victims, who have eaten them. But the motivation is what really sets him apart. He kills only so that he can keep them. And we don't see that. We don't see that. So... If you think about, I was having a conversation with somebody in my kitchen yesterday as I'm, you know, trying to put all of this together. If you think about Dahmer's sexual urges, it's almost like a macabre misfire of arousal from the human body because we're all supposed to be sexually aroused by the human body. That couldn't be more normal. But somehow the errors in Dahmer had him aroused to the actual gross anatomy of the body rather than just the erogenous zones. I wonder if he had any, like, just normal sexual experiences. Nope, did not. Never tried to date. Hasn't, had never had any heterosexual experiences. And it's, it's interesting because I thought about, okay, so you are this awkward person with this personality disorder. You don't know you have personality disorder. You just know you can't connect with people. He's like, I'm never going to get a date. I'm weird as fuck. Right. But he's going to have to have sex. He describes Heidi the sexiness of the glistening internal organs and how much he really enjoyed slitting and peeling the skin to look at the capillaries. Oh, Aren't wow. You glad you're here to see? <laughs> My gosh, I'm hungry. My sister has much more normal career aspirations than, than me, but yeah, I'm sorry. If you're in my family, you have to hear this shit. Yeah, it's, a, it's yeah. very interesting. And this one is definitely not typical, so it's but it also and making me mad. But I'm, it makes me mad too, and it makes me furious for those families, and it makes me freaking furious about all the times he was almost caught. But we'll hit that beat in a minute. Um, I think all of those weird obsessions of like the 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 fascination, the attraction to the gross anatomy is all related to the schizotypal personality disorder. I am not saying people with that disorder are sexually attracted to body, but they often have an, uh, a, an unusual fascination. Right, and Dahmer's that just happened just to be his. Right. Right. I get that then. Yeah. So in these FBI interviews, Dahmer described in harrowing detail exactly how he would have sex with the bodies and the methods he used to dismember them. And he did all of it in his own apartment. And anyone, as you just mentioned, has who's seen the Netflix documentary knows that this was not unnoticed by neighbors. The neighbor was not next door like they play it out in Netflix. It was a person who lived nearby, I think, in a different apartment building. Not a quiet but process. She, no, it's not. And yeah, no matter what you do, like, if, you know, there is. Yeah. Bones are hard. It's a hard, it's hard to get rid of a, a body and it's, do you, you don't use small yeah. tools. It has to be know? like an axe. I have seen movies mm -hmm. about oh. this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of research. You know, sometimes people grow up with serial killers and they don't even know that they grew up with a serial killer. Yeah. Sometimes their sibling drives them to be serial killers. Whatever. Wouldn't it be ironic if one of my relatives ended up being a serial killer? Um, I know who it would be. <laughs> okay, anyway, people called the police. This one woman called repeatedly, and I shudder to think about how many boys and men would have been saved if law enforcement had heeded her warnings. Um, and one of the most traumatic, you know, as I said, I'm not going to go through all of them, but one traumatizing story recounted his, um, the 14-year-old boy. So there were a few times Dahmer was nearly caught, but this one's so bad. In 1991, Dahmer approached a 14-year-old with an offer um, for him to come to Dahmer's house and pose for Polaroid pictures, and Dahmer would pay him, and the boy agreed. And he, of course, Dahmer drugs him and performs oral sex on him. He's 14. Then Dahmer did the Dahmer trick, and he drilled a narrow 
hole into this child's skull. He injected hydrochloric acid into the frontal lobe, so he's lobotomizing him. He knows what he's doing. Can he still feel it? Can the, the victim feel and know what's going on? He's so drugged. He's so drugged. He's a combination of sleeping pills. He's very, very drugged up when this happens. He's not fighting it. And then the brain itself has no nerve endings. The brain itself you can't feel. It's just the getting through the skull, but he makes sure that they're unconscious when that happens. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying he's sweet, but so then Dahmer's like, sweet, I've got my, my zombie. And he drank a bunch of beers, fell asleep for a little bit next to him. And then he woke up and he wanted to go to the bar and get more, more alcohol. But when he returns, when Dahmer returns to his apartment, he sees the 14 year old sitting naked outside speaking in his native language. He's from Laos. And there's three distressed women standing near him. So I have to say Dahmer's quick thinking. He's quick. For somebody who has such limited interpersonal re- uh, relationships like and experiences, he's quick with his tongue. I feel so like he, he is out. smart. Like uh, I think that, you know, for him to, he's creative or whatever, because for him mm-hmm. to think of all these ways to, um, ha- like drilling the holes in the, the head and do it like he he is smart and to have a fascination with the inside of your a human body and the capillaries and you know I do think that he is intelligent mm-hmm. and he is quick thinking and that's why he's been able to um, continue the killings the murdering for so long yep he's no dummy that's exactly right the dumb ones get caught quick right they're caught quickly and um, you know the smarter ones aren't caught as quickly so he goes up to these women and he's like, oh, no, no, this is just a friend. And the women aren't having it. They're like, look, you're staying here. We call 911. And this boy had blood on his testicles. He was bleeding from his rectum. Um, he's struggling against Dahmer. Like, he doesn't want to be with Dahmer, but he has literally had acid poured into his brain. And he's, you know, he can't advocate for himself. He is in a completely... I, I, I mean, he the fact that he was alive was miraculous. The fact that he could make himself, his, make his way down outside the mm-hmm. apartment, outside. That's his will. Like, he's trying to fight for himself, but he can't articulate anything because he's, um, you know, his brain has been <laughs> messed yeah, with. Major damage. Acid on. I'm not even sure what he, how he could have survived that. But one point I was going to say really quickly is, a monster doesn't look like a monster. Like, you know, the boogeyman doesn't look like your boogeyman, like the typical boogeyman. So that's what makes these serial killers or any type of murderer so scary is, right. you know, like, and that's what I would tell my kids is that, you know, th- uh, they have charisma, Ted Bundy. Yeah. Like they, they know how to talk to people. They know how to, 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 prey on people and to have people like them and, and whatnot. It's, it's part of their like gift. Especially, especially a psychopath. That's their gift is their charm. This guy was, this guy was quick tongued. He was weird. People didn't like connect to him, but they, he was so quick and unassuming looking, like you said, he did not look like a boogeyman. No. I mean, he's, I, he's not good looking to, because we know what he's done. Like I know it, but there, he's not like, he's, He's not awful looking, like he doesn't look scary or anything, you know, no. now that we know no, who he, he is. Yeah, he's not like, oh, my God, stay away from that guy or right. not at all. So, well, and it was convincing enough for the police. They didn't see all that other blood. They just saw a scrape on this child. And they told those women to butt out, shut the hell up, don't interfere. Oh, wow. And that this was in the 90s? Yeah, and this was in a primarily um, African-American community, and it was it's really frustrating. When also, Dahmer's like, oh, he's just drunk. Well, if you see a 14-year-old drunk, like, you do something if you're law enforcement. But anyway, Dahmer gets away with it, brings him back to the apartment, does the injection of the hydrochloric acid again, and, of course, it's fatal. Do you know what's ironic is that Dahmer actually had gotten caught molesting this poor child's older brother? And then the younger child goes with Dahmer anyway and ends up dead. So I thought that he just met him on... He did, but he had coincidentally, unbeknownst to Dahmer, 
this was the young, younger sibling of the boy that had gotten Dahmer caught for molestation. So Dahmer was a registered sex offender. So he had been had trouble with the police. Yes, a couple of times. So prior to being caught, one time he exposed himself to some children. Um, another time he masturbated in front of some children. And this time he had molested a child. So he'd, he'd gotten in trouble. He had had attorneys. He had, um, you know, he had dealt with the consequences. But somehow he's always out. So another time Dahmer was almost caught was when the police came to his apartment in a door-to-door search because a neighbor on a different floor had been killed. And they asked to look around his apartment, but then they didn't. And then another time his locker was searched at his workplace. And remember, he has that mummified head in it, but he had painted it gray. So people thought it was fake. He's super smart. Like you said, you're the one who said it. He's super smart. He's not a psychopath. He's not charming smart. He's smart. He's smart. He's a nerd. He's a nerd. He's he's a disconnected, mentally disordered. Yeah, because somebody who, you know, is just quick thinking and just wanted to, you know, ha- he, they wouldn't go that far to think, I'm going to paint it so it looks fake. Mm-hmm. So he had been nabbed for exposure, nabbed for molestation, nabbed um, for, you know, almost nabbed for having a drunk 14-year-old in his possession. He'd had his apartment searched. He had his skull that he brought to work found. There's no stopping this guy. So Jeffrey Dahmer would be satisfied for a while after a kill, but then the urges would return. And as I said, he kept these mementos in an attempt to stave off the need to kill again. Um, the, The best source of supply for him were the photographs. So that would help him. Like, he, if he could just look at his Polaroids over and over and over again, he could avoid killing again as quickly as he wanted to. And compared to you and me, he is so low on human characteristics of compassion and empathy. But as we've said, in serial killer world, he is higher than usual. So in my academic circle, and this is really impolite, but in my academic circle, we called him the serial killer with a heart who ate a heart. And it's not funny. But it was it was pivotal in how we came to learn and understand more about serial killers. It's not just psychopathy that can make one. You know, you can become a serial killer in various ways. And as people who have spent our lives studying violence and how, you know, it's caused and, and including genetics and biology, where before only environment had been studied, like that was very important for us to understand the distinction, the difference between Jeffrey Dahmer and his, you know, disgusting counterparts. This is interesting, Heidi. When investigators asked him, did you ever attempt to stop? And he said, well, you know, at some points I did enjoy this lifestyle. Like I got a huge, like satisfying that urge was huge, hugely, you know, gratifying for me. He said he did not, if even if there was a place he could call anonymously, he wouldn't have done it. He did attempt religion at one point to see if it could curb his urges And at one point when he was living with grandma, he did think about turning himself in, but then, you know, he didn't. He had some self-preservation that certainly outweighed any guilt he had for these um, poor men and boys. He insists that this was not racial and that he hated killing. He did not hate his victims. And this was not anyone's fault. And he also admitted he'd kill again. Yeah, I think it was just opportunity. Like, he was an opportunist. Like, it doesn't matter what race. Like, he was just a 14-year-old boy. You, they just had to be good looking. They just had to have a Chippendale's body. That's it. He said that. He's like, I didn't. You have a Chippendale's body? Like, he had I young mean, victims. Yeah. They just had to be young and, and ripped. That was what he looked for. Athletic, hot, model-looking guys. And I mean, one of his victims was somebody who did not communicate um, verbally. And that to me, it's just so freaking disgusting how vulnerable these victims were. He took, it was easy targets, even though easy targets. he had a I mean, certain look. He, a 14 year old boy, you could tell, you offer him money or anything. Mm-hmm. And, you know. And once you drug them, like, come on. So in an interview with Stone Phillips, Dahmer himself said he didn't think anything, any person or any experience of his childhood had anything to do with his crimes. As far as I'm concerned, they're all excuses, he says. I feel it's wrong for people who commit crimes to shift the blame on somebody else, onto their parents or their upbringing. Um, in his case, I, I, I mean, he's on to something. I'm not saying, he obviously had some serious problems in his upbringing, 
but something happened. He does have this very serious personality disorder. It's not being talked about enough, in my opinion. Um, and I think this is just an additional piece to the puzzle to truly understand Jeffrey Dahmer, not for entertainment purposes, but because the better we understand this, the better chance we have of not raising a future Jeff Jeffrey Dahmer. And he is smart enough, he's intellectual enough to know that it had nothing to do with his upbringing and it's just who he is and and his mental illness. And so that's the hard part is because, um, you know, you have someone like Richard Dahmer or, or Richard, wait, Richard, Richard Dahmer, that's a, that's okay. a whole nightmare. Richard Ramirez, who's like, he, you know, he's doing like, um, wasn't he saying something about Satan and this and mm -hmm. that? Like, and so he's just kind of, it's like dramatic. And, and it seems like Dahmer is like, he knows who he is. You know, mm -hmm. he has self-awareness. He knows he self -awareness. Can't blame that anyone on himself. And, you know, like it's, there is a big difference. I don't know yeah. a lot of, um, a lot of serial killers or murderers behave like that. You know, it's he was definitely more different. impulsive. His is more thought out, methodically. And, and a lot of them are methodical and well-planned and calculating. His motivation was different than the others. Um, so I wanted to go over some of the questions. One person asked me, was his brain ever scanned? And um, it was. It was scanned. No autopsy was performed, but his brain was scanned. But I don't think... Well, and, and another person asked me what I think would have... This is the second person in my professional opinion, what would I expect to see on his brain studies? So yes, his brain was scanned. And I would have expected to see what we see in other people who suffer from schizophrenia and schizophrenic uh, um, spectrum disorders, larger ventricles, um, perhaps a reduction in gray matter. But that's not what they were looking at in the court, in the trial. They were looking for probably a lesion or a tumor some some clear injury is what they were looking for. They might, I, I would be very surprised if they were privy to these studies that indicate that there's, you know, a measurable difference. It's a, it's, it's a, it, it's an average reduction. So you take a bunch of brains and on average, the brains of schizophrenics have these larger ventricles and reduced gray matter. And they don't know to do that necessarily. I don't think that they were looking for that, but I would expect to see that his brain looks like the brains of other um, people who suffer from this disorder. And I would expect his temporal lobe to be affected. And that's where empathy, guilt, remorse, it lives in the limbic system, which, you know, is in your temporal lobe. And, and they tend to have um, dysfunction in those areas. That does, that does happen with people who suffer from schizotypal personality disorder. Um, and Heidi, I want your opinion on this one. Somebody asks, would he have been positively positively affected by today's culture versus back then? And what she actually wrote to me um, to to expand on that, and it's kind of we're more accepting today. We have a very we know more. What I what I read into her question is we know more about personality disorders. Um, what do you think? I, I definitely think we're more accepting society, and and you know, especially like for people that you know are struggling with their sexuality and whatnot. But I think that he would not have said anything. I don't think he still would have noticed. I think he was very private. I think he didn't want people to know. I think he was just gratifying his urges. And he, you know, I still don't... Fly under the radar. Yeah, I do think he's just, he looks, he doesn't look like a monster. He knows how to yeah. interact in public he's not charismatic but he just is simple you know like he just like you said blends in flies under the radar um i i don't even think you know if we are more accepting of people's sexuality i don't even really think it's about sexuality i think it's, it's not no i think we're more accepting we're more understanding of well i think where where we would have maybe maybe is where we understand people who are not neurotypical we have much more information about people who are not neurotypical, and he might have been flagged for that. Right. Like when you say depressed when you're six years old, what is what is that teacher really seeing? You know, like an introvert? Yes. Is it depression? What? So we can, we do have more resources in schools now. Like we do have mm -hmm. psychologists and IEPs and that sort, sort of thing. Um, I'm just not sure how obvious it was. 
maybe he would have been flagged so watched more carefully. Maybe um, he wouldn't have been so afraid to um, be more present in the homosexual community. Maybe the I think law enforcement treats this kind of stuff better now. They they're it, they're not likely to let a drunk fourteen year old go with a grown ass man. I think that has changed. I think we are more aware of even um, well and yeah and, and adults who are not neurotypical and mental illness that's pervasive. So I think I cannot tell you that he would not have been a successful serial killer today. But I think there's he it's it it's worse that he was acting when he was it would have possibly been better at the time today and i think we just have more resources in solving crimes and i think there's more awareness of sexual predators so maybe that young boy that was 14 they would have been like okay blood on his penis is not normal i don't Mm -hmm. care if it's a cut he got a cut somehow he's not drunk like they could look in your eyes and tell if you're if you've been drinking, you know, now they have a lot more tools for that sort of thing. Um, however, I don't think he would have probably come forth and said, I need help because everything was all, in- he was handling it internally. He yeah, was he was not given clues. With alcohol. He was and, yeah. nice to his family. Like he knew how to work that and he was always an introvert. So that was normal behavior to all anyone who knew him. Yeah, he was, he, normally you would see more signs, but he was a master at hiding them. And another question was, what was he like before age 14? And did his parents notice anything? And yeah, they, they noticed after the surgery that he became much more withdrawn and different. And someone else asked what his relationship was like with his brother. And I think it just didn't exist. I just don't think he had a relationship with his brother. Um, yeah, I think he was just kind of like a lone ranger until it came to like, people that he had a little feelings for, like his grandmother mm-hmm. and his parents. But other than that, he just would rather be by himself and then alone in his thoughts. And I'm going to try and fight it. But since I can't fight it, I'm going to be really creative with it and enjoy it. Someone else asked, what was the turning point of him killing and getting more comfortable with it? And I think it was the, after that second killing. So he killed somebody when he was 18, waited 10 years, killed again. And then it seemed then that, you know, the train had left the station at that point. He was off and running. I think he was scared Um, when the police first came and it kind of scared him. But then I think after 10 years, there was a few incidents that where he could have gotten caught and didn't. So even though he could have gotten caught the first killing, he didn't. Then people were complaining about the noises and police came to his apartment. He didn't get caught. He didn't get caught with the 14-year-old boy. So I think he's just like, I'm not going to get caught. And I'm just... Mm -hmm. He gets emboldened by it. Good. He was getting excitement from it, the killings and whatnot. It satisfied his urges. Um, Someone else asked, did he express any regret or sorrow? Um, Especially that that man, that young man he killed who had, you know, he he had an inability to to communicate verbally. That that one's particularly sad. Uh, Dahmer did express some limited regret and sorrow, um, but not enough, not enough to, you know, and it, and by the way, when you see a, a killer going, oh, I'm so sorry, a serial killer, usually it's not true. Dahmer's pretty honest. I mean, he's not a psychopath, but he, he definitely is a liar, but I, he was so forthcoming with everything that I felt watching his interviews. I mean, I've, I've been in the room with many, many killers and I'm not always great at telling when they're telling the truth or lying. I have these little tricks, these little things that, you know, one day I will tell you guys about that I do to try to um, figure out. It's kind of like lie, lie tests to see if somebody's lying to me. Um, Dahmer seems like he's kind of pretty forthcoming about this stuff. I think he had limited regret, lim- lim- limited feelings about it. Do you think he was happy he was caught? I think he was. I mean, he said he didn't, he wasn't doing anything to get caught. He wasn't trying to get caught. But I think there was a sense of relief once he was caught, and that's not uncommon. And and how did he? Do you know how he behaved in prison? He's fine. He had you know great behavior. So what happened to all those urges? And the I mean, was he sexual in prison? Do you? I don't think so. He once the opportunity, you know, in this he he reported this like you know I didn't do there were years I didn't do anything, and he didn't. But I mean, he did he did sexually assault somebody in the mil- when he was in the army in Germany. He he said, look, it just was too hard to have access. I still had the urges. They weren't as much as they were once he started killing again. That just made his urges grow. But I think 
For him, if he's caged, if he just can't get to the person, if he just can't, then then there's that, you know, then there's that. It's just interesting, you know, like here you haven't been able to control him at all and you're running wild with all of this and then it just stops. Well, I think it's like putting a, a banana in front of a monkey. If there are bananas hanging in front of him, he has to do it. But if there's no banana hanging in front of him, he, if he doesn't have access to young men who he can trick into coming back to his apartment or hotel, then he just doesn't. And and remember, the killing begets the killing. So each experience he has makes him want more. So I think it lies dormant when he can't have access to it. You know, when you're hanging the, the banana in front of the monkey, the monkey's going nuts. He wants it. He has to have it. Someone else asked if his parents were normal, would he have still turned out this way? Um they weren't. I mean, they they were, you know, his parents kind of abandoned him when he was a senior. They weren't the worst parents I've ever... He did not have an Ozzy and Harriet upbringing, but they weren't the worst parents. But I think the Netflix um, documentary makes the dad look a little weirder than he is. And the dad wrote a book saying, oh my God, I, maybe I'm weird too. And of course he's, you know, everyone, no one's perfect. I think this is beyond bad parenting. Um, I think a if he hadn't had that surgery, we may have seen something different. I don't know. But I don't think the parents were as abnormal as were being made to, well, the to fact, feel Well, yeah, the fact that he could even, like, if I had been different, would it have been, you know, would he have turned out different? The fact that he, they think that they could have possibly behaved differently, that it, that to me is saying so much. Like, it's obviously not his fault. Like, we're all parents. We all try our best. Um, this it, no one gets along. We all get divorced. We all fight. But it's it's telling of uh, the father's character that he even cares enough to even think that maybe he is responsible for his. Oh, he has spent the rest of his life doing it. Yeah. Um, and the last question: Did he really try to make someone into a zombie? Yes, those were the words Dahmer used. He was trying to create a zombie. All right, now I need to go vomit. That was a hard one. It's disgusting, you know, and even for me, who this is what I chose to do for a living. I felt like I understand it a little bit better now, or at least I, I understand there's things I don't understand, like that we can't ever fit him into a box and we're not going to find all the answers in parenting. But it's still, he is still a mysterious, um, he's still a very mysterious killer. And I just hope that there's no more out there. If we do, we have mm -hmm. the tools to identify it. This has been How Not to Raise a Serial Killer, and we will see you again soon. How Not to Raise a Serial Killer is a Cloud 10 Media production, executive produced by me, Dr. Michelle Ward, and Sim Sarna. Our editor is Emily Crane. Our music was created by Josh Cook, with artwork provided by Brian Stefanik. Follow us on Instagram at How Not to Raise a Serial Killer, and on TikTok and Twitter at Hentrask. That's at H N. T-R-A-S-K. And if you'd like to share a story or ask a question, you can email us at hownottoraiseaserialkiller at gmail.com or call and leave a voicemail at 818-392-4403. If you like our show, do me a favor and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. After all, if more people know about the show, maybe fewer kids will turn into serial killers. Who knows? Thanks so much for listening. See you next week.